Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to tell my story. And it's a story about my journey from organs to cells. So here it is. I was privileged to train in transplantation under two great surgical pioneers. Thomas Stasel, who performed the world's first successful liver transplant in 1967 in the United States. And Sir Roy Khan, who performed Europe and the UK's first liver transplant the following year. I returned to Singapore and in 1990 performed Asia's first successful cadaveric liver transplant. But against all odds, when I look back, the surgery was actually the easiest part. Next, raising the money to fund the procedure. But perhaps most challenging of all was to convince the regulators in a matter that got debated in Parliament that a young female surgeon be given the chance to pioneer for her country. But 20 years on, my patient Surinda is Asia's longest surviving cadaveric liver transplant patient today. And more important, I am the proud godmother to her 14-year-old son. But not all transplant candidates are so fortunate. The truth is, there's simply not enough donor organs. While the demand for donor organs has continued to rise because of the aging population, the supply has remained relatively constant. In the US alone, 100,000 men, women and children are on the wait list for donor organs, and more than a dozen perish each day because of a lack of organs. The transplant community has, over the years, worked to campaign in donor organs, and the gift of life was extended from brain-dead donors to living donors, relatives who might be able to donate a part of an organ to a loved one. But because there was still this shortage of organs, the gift of life was then extended from living related donors to living unrelated donors. And here then has been a controversial situation. How can you distinguish a voluntary donation, one that is altruistic, from a donation that is coerced or forced from, for example, a subservient spouse, an in-law, a servant, a slave, an employee? Where and how can we draw the line? In my part of the world, too many people live below poverty line. And in some areas, the commercial gifting of an organ in exchange for monetary reward has led to a flourishing trade in living unrelated donors. Shortly after I did the first liver transplant, I received my next assignment. And that was to harvest organs from executed prisoners. I was also pregnant at the time. Pregnancies are meant to be happy and fulfilling moments in a woman's life. But my pregnant period was filled with solemn and morbid thoughts. Thoughts of walking through the prison's high security death row because this was the only route to the makeshift operating room. And at each time, I would feel and imagine the chilling stares of condemned prisoners' eyes follow me. And for two years, I grappled with the dilemma of waking up at 4.30 a.m. in the morning, driving to the prisons, getting gowned, gloved, and scrubbed, ready to receive the executed prisoner's body, harvest the organs, transport the organs to the recipient hospital, 
and then bestow the gift of life to recipient the same afternoon. No doubt I was informed that consent had been obtained. But my one surgical skill that had given me so much fulfillment in my professional life now gave rise to feelings of conflict. From extreme sorrow and doubt at dawn to celebratory joy in bestowing the gift of life to recipient at dusk. In my team, the lives of one or two of my colleagues were tainted by this experience. Some others may have been sublimated, but really none of us remain the same. I was troubled that the retrieval of organs from executed prisoners was at least as morally controversial as the harvesting of stem cells from human embryos. And in my mind, I realized as a surgical pioneer that the position, the purpose of my position of influence was surely to speak up for those who have no influence. It made me wonder if there could be a better way to circumvent death and yet deliver the gift of life that could impact millions of patients worldwide. Just at that time, the practice of surgery evolved from big to small, from big open incisions to tiny incisions, keyhole surgeries. And in transplantation, concepts shifted from whole organs to cells. In 1988, at the University of Minnesota, I participated in a small series of whole organ pancreas transplants. I witnessed the technical difficulty, and this inspired a shift in my mindset from transplanting whole organs to transplanting cells. I thought to myself, why not take the individual cells out of the pancreas and transplant these cells, the islet cells that secrete insulin to cure diabetes? technically a much simpler procedure, than grappling with the complexities of transplanting a whole organ. And just at this time, stem cell research had started to gain momentum following the isolation of the world's first human embryonic stem cells in the 1990s. The observation that stem cells as master cells could give rise to a whole wide variety of different cell types, heart cells, liver cells, pancreatic islet cells, captured the attention of the media and the imagination of the public. I too was fascinated by this new and disruptive cell technology, and this inspired a shift in my mindset from transplanting whole organs to transplanting cells. Today, we appreciate that there are many different types of stem cells. Embryonic stem cells have occupied center stage chiefly because they are pluripotent, which means they can give rise to a whole wide variety of different cell types. But the moral controversy surrounding embryonic stem cells has encouraged research into other different types of stem cells. Now, to the ridicule of my colleagues, and I will repeat again, the ridicule of my colleagues, I decided to inspire my lab to focus its research on what I thought was the most non-controversial source of stem cells, adipose tissue or fat. Yes, fat. Readily available <laughs> and in abundant supply nowadays and which you and I would probably have no qualms in getting rid of. <laughs> Fat-derived stem cells are adult stem cells. And adult stem cells can be found in you and me, in our blood, in our bone marrow, in our fat, in our skin, and other organs. As it turns out, fat is the best source of adult stem cells, but a limitation to adult stem cells is because they are mature cells, they are restricted in their behavior and unlike embryonic stem cells, are unable to give rise to a whole wide range of cell types. However, 
In 2007, two remarkable individuals, Shinya Yamanaka of Japan and Jamie Thompson of the United States, made an astounding discovery. And they discovered, and listen to this, that adult stem cells taken from you and me could be reprogrammed or rebooted back to embryonic-like cells, which they termed iPS cells, or induced pluripotent stem cells. So here's the deal. Scientists around the world and in our labs are taking adult stem cells, aged adult stem cells, and reprogram reprogramming them back into youthful iPS cells. And in our lab, we are focused on taking fat, adipose tissue of fat. And in the lab, reprogramming mounds of fat into fountains of youthful, embryonic-like cells. Cells that may then give rise to other differentiated cell types that may one day be used in cell transplants. And if this research is successful, it may one day reduce the need for us to sacrifice human embryos for stem cell research. So there is a lot of hype, but also hope, that the promise of stem cells may one day provide cures for a whole range of diseases. Stroke, diabetes, spinal cord injury, muscular dystrophy, retinal eye diseases. Are any of these conditions relevant personally to you? In May 2006, something horrible happened to me. I was about to start a robotic operation, but stepping out of the elevator into the glaring lights of the operating room, I realized that my left visual field was fast collapsing into darkness. Earlier that week, I had taken a hard knock during late spring skiing. Yes, I fell. And then I started to see floaters and stars, which I casually dismissed to too much high altitude sun exposure. What happened to me? could have been disastrous, but fortunately I was within reach of great surgical care and had my vision restored, but not before a prolonged period of convalescence, three months to be precise, nursed in a head down position. This experience taught me to empathize more with my patients, and especially those with retinal diseases. 37 million people worldwide are blind. 124 million more have impaired vision. Stem cell-derived retinal transplants, still in a research phase, may one day restore vision or part vision to millions of patients worldwide. Indeed, we live in both exciting as well as challenging times. As we speak and as the world population ages, Scientists are trying to invent new ways to enhance the power of the body to heal itself through stem cells. It is a fact that when our organs or tissues are injured, our bone marrow releases stem cells, and these stem cells enter the circulation and travel and home into the damaged organs to release growth factors that help the injured tissue to repair. Stem cells may be used as building blocks to repair damaged scaffolds within our body, like providing new liver cells to repair damaged organs. And as we speak, there are approximately 117 clinical trials worldwide investigating the role of stem cells in liver diseases. What lies ahead? Heart disease is the leading cause of death worldwide. 1.1 million Americans suffer heart attacks yearly, and 4.8 million live in cardiac failure. Stem cells may be used to deliver growth factors to repair damaged heart muscle, or to be differentiated into heart muscle cells to restore heart function. 
There are currently approximately 170 clinical trials worldwide investigating the role of stem cells in heart disease. While still in the research phase, this cell-based and disruptive technology may one day herald a quantum leap in medicine. Stem cells provide hope for new beginnings. Small, incremental steps, cells rather than organs, repair rather than replacement. Stem cell therapies may one day reduce the need for donor organs. As we speak, powerful new technologies always present enigmas. In the US, embryonic stem cell trial is currently underway for spinal cord injury following the US FDA approval. And in the UK, neural stem cells to cure stroke are currently being investigated in a phase one trial. The research success that we celebrate today is due to the curiosity and the commitment of individual scientists and medical pioneers. Each one of them has his story. My story has been about my journey from organs to cells, a journey through controversy inspired by hope. Hope that as we age, you and I may one day celebrate longevity with an improved quality of life.